Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. Today we're going to be talking about the summer issue of the Wilson Quarterly, Ripples of War. With the world on the hinge of history, we examine the ever-widening impacts of the Russia Ukraine war. As always, joining us for these WQ episodes is the editor of the, the award-winning WQ. That's Stephanie Bowen. Stephanie, hi. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Thank you, John. Always a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, Stephanie, from the wilds of New York, of upstate New York, right? Correct. <laughs> yes, and, and, uh, exactly. And here in studio, one of your contributors, Will Sands, is a documentary photographer and journalist. He's the co-founder of the Fractures Collective, and his work has been published by the Washington Post, Mother Jones, and Harper's, among others. He's also, as I mentioned, a contributor to this issue of the WQ. His photo essay is titled, Weapons of a Hybrid War, and we'll have more on that in a moment. But Stephanie, if we could begin by asking you to provide us with an overview of the issue. Sure. Um, as you said, the issue takes a look at the impacts of the Russia-Ukraine war, and it's really a full issue. There, um, we hear from current and former policy leaders, policymakers. We hear from um, journalists and professors, and we talk about uh, Putin and sanctions and energy and food, uh, migration, uh, saving Ukraine's artwork. I mean, it really, really runs um, the gamut. And we take a, a deep dive into a lot of issues. And I, I think there's really something for everyone. Yeah, you know, I'm a, a big fan of the quarterly and of your work. And I think this one, you've hit it out of the park. It really is an amazing collection of essays, uh, not the least of which is yours, Will. Uh, the photo essay. But before we dive into that, could you tell us about the Fractured collect, uh, Collective? What is it and what is the work that you do? Yeah. Um, so Fractures is a, a small collective of four photographers. Um, we're based in, in three continents, North America, South America, and Europe. Um, the, the collective was born in 2011 as an initiative to um, promote our, our work as, as beginning ph photographers and photojournalists. Um, and we've basically we've broken down the work into four categories, um, and it's the way that we kind of interpret the the world around us and report. So there's fractures in the economic system, fractures in the social system, um, political and environmental, um, and more or less our our work sort of breaks down along along those four lines. And tell me about the term documentary photographer. How is that different from say a photojournalist? So there's a, there's there's a fair amount of interlap uh, overlap. Um, I do pr primarily long format projects, um, so I do do some photojournalism, um, some news work, but the the majority of my work is is long format projects that are, you know, following a subject matter or or a subject over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, like what we see in the, in the yeah, future of the like quarterly. What we see this time. Stephanie, do you want to do the setup for weapons of a hybrid war and give us a little bit, pull back the curtain. How did you end up uh, finding Will and adding this to this issue of the quarterly? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, I think it's very interesting because Will and I uh, were connected through our partners at Narratively. They often connect us with uh, journalists and Will initially did a dispatch for us after our fall issue on human migration, and he was going over to um, over to Europe and really looking at uh, migration over there. And um, it was it, it just sort of the timing worked that he was going to be going back and. Um, looking at what was happening in the wake of the Russia-Ukraine war. And he'll tell you all about this, but he uh, was over there in 2014 and um, he has followed this issue for a really long time. And when we decided to do this piece, I, I really, um, I thought it was an interesting way to not only cover the migration that was stemming from the war itself and Ukrainians who were fleeing um, Ukraine into Europe, but also uh, some of the other uh, people, refugees fleeing um, Putin's bomb in, uh, bombs in Syria and other places, uh, other wars that were happening and bringing, bringing people to Europe. So this really was, I thought, an interesting 
um, way to look at the migration issue that was coming out of the war, but also look at it a little differently um, and through photography, really beautiful photography. And there are about 25 images in the piece. Yeah. And uh, uh, how long of a period of time is covered by the photo essay? Um, so the work is, is from two reporting trips, um, each one of them about two weeks. And uh, here's something you write in the essay. Lukashenko and Putin sought to destabilize Europe with a hybrid war along Europe's borders with Belarus and Ukraine. Migration is being weaponized. Can you explain the concept of a hybrid war and how migration is being weaponized? Sure. Um, so I guess I'd go back a little bit and just say that, that the sort of my intention with this project was to try and position the, the, the current refugee crisis, the, refu the Ukrainian refugee crisis within the broader context of of refugee policy in Europe um, and writ large. Um, so I started first looking at people coming out of Ukraine um, and then came across this, this issue along the, the Polish-Belarusian um, border. So in 2021, subsequent to, to Lukashenko's elections um, and, and the increased um, sanctions and, and, and international pressure primarily from Europe, um, Lukashenko, together with Putin, um, created this, this refugee crisis along the Belarusian border, um, where they were essentially aiding folks uh, to cross the border, aiding folks to get to Belarus to, to cross the border, and using um, the refugee flow as a way to, to um, push forward their, their geopolitical goals um, in the region. Um, so that's in 2021, the end of 2021. Um, fast forward and, and Feb to February, the invasion happens of, of Ukraine um, and the international attention really begins to focus more on, on what's happening in Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees. Um, but the crisis along the Belarusian border with, with Poland continued um, and that flow of folks continued to cross. So it's a rolling crisis and Ukraine exactly. becomes a spike in exactly. something that's been ongoing. Correct. Yeah, uh, uh, Stephanie, uh, you don't get to do any more edits, but you can ask a question. <laughs> of, of Will, <laughs> well, well I, I would like to bring up something. It was so interesting when Will came back from, I, I don't even think you were back yet, Will. You, we were communicating via WhatsApp and you were telling me what was going on over there. And you were talking about the exclusion zone. And I just remember the, just the urgency in your voice and sort of that this felt very different um, and eye-opening to you. And I'd like, it would be great if you could explain a little bit about what, what you saw when you and felt when you first um, and, and tell a little bit about the exclusion zone. I think that'll be helpful. OK, um, so in reaction to this, this massive flow, I mean, there's massive is relative, but 20,000 folks um, that were crossing the border in the over the course of the summer of 2021 and into the fall of 2021. Um, one of the measures that that first Lithuania and then Poland took to stem the flow was they created this, this essentially this, what they call an exclusion zone. So it's a um, 10 to 15 kilometer wide swath of land that runs the length of the border with Belarus in both countries, both in, in Lithuania and in, in, in Poland. Um, and in that space, um, all constitutional rights were, were um, suspended. Um, so the police were free to search, um, free to detain and stop anyone in the area. Um, the press was strictly prohibited from, from entering um, and it began a, a process of this sort of militarization and, and build up along the border um, that included the deployment of thousands of uh, police forces as well as military. Um, and for me, as a journalist, I mean, I was, I was blown away with the sort of lack of visibility of the area. Um, and what was actually happening on the ground, and and quite frankly, the the juxtaposition with what was happening on the ground in, in the exclusion zone, um, compared to just two hundred mile two hundred kilometers to the south, along the the Ukrainian um, Polish border, where the border was essentially open, um, aid agencies were were um, in a full full on mode of deployment and and aid. Um, 
to people crossing over from Ukraine, but 200 kilometers to the north, those same folks doing the same kind of work were totally um, criminalized, and anybody covering what was happening were also criminalized. T talk about that disparity a little more. I know one of the, I think, social workers you talked to said it's pure and simple racism. What did you observe in that regard? Was that clear even on the ground? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 um, in the first days of the, of the invasion of Ukraine, we heard a lot about the, the racism along the Polish border of um, uh, folks from, from sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East that were studying in, in Ukraine and, and sought refuge in Poland, trying to get out um, to escape the war. And, and sort of the, the reaction of Polish um, border guards not allowing um, folks of color to cross the border. And, and so there was an obvious sort of immediate attention on that. Um, and then it sort of petered out as that pressure brought changes in policy changes and people started to be able to cross more easily. But the structural nature of what was happening in the exclusion zone remained. Um, and it, it, the way that it sort of operates on the ground it is it's very, um, the sort of racialized police, policing is very, very tangible. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're specifically targeting anybody who's not white or anybody who looks like they're from the Middle East. Um, primarily the, the large flow of people right now crossing across um, into, into Poland from Belarus are from the Horn of Africa um, and Afghanistan and Syria. Um, so they're, they're being targeted primarily because of their race and, and religion. I thought what we'd do now is take a look at some of the photos. Mm -hmm. and, and I should explain, our viewers, you're gonna see them. Uh, to those of you listening to the audio podcast, uh, what I would recommend is go to Double Wilson Quarterly and you can follow along with the article and find 25 photos. Uh, and we will talk about some of them. And Will, what I'd ask you to do, and Stephanie, you as well, is when we talk about each, if there's any other thing that you'd like to bring up that is relevant beyond what we see in the image, just please feel free to do so. So this first image, Will, is uh, of the border uh, with Lithuania. And we see, you know, there were a lot of talk of border walls in this country during the Trump years. We see a border uh, a metal fence with lots of barbed wire mm -hmm. and a trench. Uh, talk to us about what you've uh, discovered along this border. Okay, so um, we got access to, myself and, and the fixer I was working with, got access to the, the border wall that's being constructed in Lithuania. Um, Poland is also constructing a, a similar wall along the Belarusian border. Um, again, because of the exclusion zone, it's very hard to get up close to the actual construction. Um, in the image, we see the, the, the photos divide in half. Um, on the right side, we're looking into Lithuania. On the left side, there's razor wire and, and fencing that, um, and behind that is Belarus. Um, one of the things that I was really struck by was sort of the theatrics of, of this whole process. Um, so while both Poland and, and Lithuania are spending millions of dollars on the construction of these, these border barriers, um, they're actually fairly flimsy structures. Mm -hmm. um, and we're already seeing videos going viral on, on social media of, of folks either cutting the, the fencing or going over the fencing or, or going, even going under the fencing. And it's um, part of what I understand is part of the weaponization factor is yeah. they've been giving tools to do that. Yes. Um, so there have been um, a fair amount of documented instances, instances where the Belarusian uh, border police have been giving um, folks crossing, um, tools, so uh, ladders, um, uh, bolt cutters, um, even case of people with shovels, mm -hmm. um, to be able to cross, um, to, to facilitate their crossing the border. So this photo uh, of a soldier helping Ukrainian refugees uh, illustrates some of what we were talking about as far as the disparity in treatment mm -hmm. among the different groups that are, are caught in these circumstances. Yeah, so this, this image is in, in um, uh, Eastern Slovakia, just about uh, about 10 kilometers from the border with, with Ukraine. Um, this was the, the first, one of the first sort of uh, refugee welcoming centers where people would arrive from Ukraine and then be distributed onto into buses or, or find work or aid from, from some of the aid agencies. Um, and again, as you said, the, this sort of disparity in terms of the, the, the welcoming that Ukrainians were receiving while just a couple hundred kilometers to the north. Yeah, soldier helping carry exactly. a child. Then uh, 
I wanted to include this picture because I think one of the difficulties in talking about an issue like this from a distance is when you get into the geopolitics and you get into the sheer numbers, mm -hmm. you lose the humanity on that mm -hmm. real individual scale. Tell us what we're seeing in this photograph. Um, yeah, so this is a, a photo of um, a social center that's called loosely coined the, the hostel. Um, it is a uh, grassroots run um, shelter for folks uh, leaving, fleeing from Ukraine. It was actually originally established as a as a place to hold materials, um, aid materials that were being donated to deal with the, the refugee care crisis along the border in 2021. And then once the war happened, they they the, obviously the, the demand, um, the scale of the the crisis of, of Ukrainians leaving and flowing into into Poland is immense. Um, I mean, I'd say historic um, in terms of the, the actual the numbers. Um, and they turned this, this four-story building into uh, uh, a shelter where people could come and go as they pleased. Um, they were operating um, entirely off of a volunteer basis, and, and all of the, the funds were coming from um, collaborations with small NGOs. Um, they were very clear about the fact that they weren't taking any money from the Polish government mm -hmm. um, and wanted to operate outside of... The sort of the the, the Polish state's um, response to the crisis, specifically because they didn't want to be caught up in sort of the the Polish government's manipulation of the the aid response for political goals, um, and they they made a really uh, strong point about sort of this disparity and the fact that they were willing to help whoever, and that they had originally started helping the folks crossing from from Belarus. And, and this is just a Ukrainian child who needs yeah. a hug. So it's a, uh, they had a, uh, a bunch of volunteer uh, psychologists, child psychologists that were on staff, um, among other staff. Um, and there was a playroom, and this is one of the Ukrainian kids who was just needing a, a hug. Now, in, this photo illustrates a number of things. I'll let you tell us what we're seeing, and then we can talk about them. So again, this, this sort of disparity. Um, this is back along the, the Polish border with Belarus. Um, we're just inside, still in, within the, the exclusion zone, so we're within the sort of 10 to 15 kilometer um, space between the border and, and what becomes non-exclusion zone. Um, these, the way that it essentially works is word of mouth. Um, so people that are crossing from Belarus um, have, you know, get the contact of people that are on the other side. There is a, a loose um, number that's circulating that's a, a, a sort of a hotline that people, when they're lost in the forest, call for aid um, and then communicate via text message with um, a, a network of grassroots aid workers. Um, and I saw an app of the exclusion zone that showed... Uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a, they're using a, um, a variety of different GPS maps that work offline. Um, so that they're able to use them even when they don't have have service. So in this situation, they had called um, needing water and some um, warm clothes. It was three men from Eritrea. Um, when we got there, the the man in the left of the photo is uh, 20 years, 20 some odd years old. Um, it was complicated because we we were really on the run and, and they're worried about being caught by the police, mm -hmm. so we couldn't really do any interviews. Um, and also our roles between me as a journalist and the aid workers was a little bit confused because it was hard to sort of distinguish those roles. So we didn't do much interviews. Uh, this next photo, another that indicates the use of technology, GPS in this, uh, mm -hmm. somebody calling for help. Yeah. Um, so same same situation, um, same kind of situation. Um, the In the, the background of the photo, we see Lena. This is her, uh, the pseudonym we're using to protect her identity. Um, Elena is a, a member of this loose network of, of aid workers um, that's predominantly dominated by women. Um, and we're in the middle of the Bilawasian forest. She had received a call the night before. It had been raining, so we couldn't get there. Um, and so we went in the next morning, and we had a, a GPS location pin where the person was supposed to be. We got there and, and couldn't find them. So presumably they had we found what looked like a, the remnants of a camp, um, and we assumed that they'd moved on when, when we didn't show up. You hope for the best, but you don't really know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Stephanie, this is a photo that you wanted to include <coughs> uh, in the exclusion zone, uh, a gravesite. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, this again gets to the the human cost here and on the, on the very personal level tell us what we're seeing yeah so um, this is one of the the heavier um, images for me in terms of the the work itself um, it's a grave site in in Poland um, still in the exclusion zone um, of a Syrian refugee um, who had crossed or had attempted to cross he and his brother um, a couple months prior to this, um, he was suffering from severe hypothermia and wasn't able to continue. Um, the brother eventually decided that he had to abandon his brother with hypothermia and go look for help. Um, what's happening now along the border is when people are picked up by Polish authorities, oftentimes they're being pushed back illegally directly into Belarus, so without any kind of process. Um, and at so, you know, most people avoid at all circumstances any interaction with, with the Polish police. And, and many people are getting caught, caught and pushed back multiple times, which was the case of these guys. Um, so the brother left to find help, found Border Patrol, um, and, and tried to explain in broken English that his brother was in need of help. Um, the Polish Border Patrol performed an illegal pushback. Um, didn't go for whatever reason to, to where the, the, the suffering brother was. Um, and then a, a couple of days later, the body was found by, by Polish police. Um, the brother has since crossed again and has now made it safely to, to Europe, um, to Western Europe. And we're, we're actually, we're trying to line up a, a interview sometime at the end of August. Um, unfortunately, he was not able to, to return to the gravesite of his brother. Um, and, and was not able to attend the funeral or any of those um, last rites. And that's just one of yeah, dozens, there's, there's and dozens, dozens and dozens, dozens of heartbreaking correct. stories. Correct. Uh, and this final image is actually a multiple images of Polaroids you took. And my understanding is you were hiding the camera under your jacket yeah. because there are some risks involved. Yeah, so in it's, it, it's illegal right now to, to work. Um, I mean, you can, you can apply for a, a, a permit to work in the zone but they're not giving them out. Um, so I couldn't openly photograph basically anywhere. Um, I couldn't let the, the authorities see that I was there. Um, but I felt like it was really important to sort of document the, the sort of omnipresence of, of this militarization and the presence of the authorities. So I had this, this um, plastic uh, Polaroid camera that I used um, oftentimes for, for subjects to give them photographs of the photographs that I'm taking. Um, and I use that to sort of document the, the, the way in which the police and the, the military are everywhere. Um, and it's a, it's a complicated situation because be, due to the, the, the war in Ukraine, there is a sort of a logical rationale behind this, this military buildup. Um, but effectively, the, the military buildup is being used on a day-to-day -day basis to control migrants um, and people seeking refuge. Um, so the pictures are uh, military, one of the times I was pulled over, you know, in supermarkets, um, just sort of the everydayness of it. Yeah, so uh, people should understand this work doesn't come without risks. And Stephanie, I'd like to get some thoughts from you on working on a piece like this. Uh, you know, it must be very rewarding to know that you get to share this really important work with a larger audience. Yeah, I think, you know, just listening to Will talk through the photos again and, and you know, reliving some of what I uh, initially wanted to bring to our audiences, it it is such an important topic and it's so complex. And sometimes, you know, we do a lot of policy analysis and we um, talk to a lot of experts, but really the just the power of an image um, and really showing them side by side these two different realities and the complexities and the humanness I think brings a different element to this complex issue of forced displacement human migration that is just getting bigger and bigger and harder <laughs> to figure out and it's something that if we as a global community um, in the US, everywhere, figure out how to, to deal with the movement of people forced and otherwise, um, 
we just did, we need to be able to to look at it at all angles and i think that's something that will's piece really helps us do so i i that's what I hope people take away. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, and I think mission accomplished as far as the power of the images. Well, well let me go all Barbara Walters on you, you know, uh, <laughs> if you were a tree. No, but but what motivates you? You know, what, what drives you? You could take terrific photographs of all kinds of subject matter. Uh, you put yourself at risk. You you uh, are have a front row seat to this human suffering. What is your motivation? Um, I'm actually, I think that the the it's it's fairly simple. I think that the role of of, of journalism is, is speaking truth to power, um, and that is really the 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 kind of work that I seek to do is is our our stories that are adding complexity and nuance to otherwise often reduced um, sort of public narratives around news stories or or larger um, political social issues that that the world faces. I, I want to get both of your thoughts on a question that uh, has loomed large in this whole discussion since the invasion, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and that is whether it has unified the West or, or not. You know, when you look at the big geopolitics, you look at NATO, there's a lot of claims that closer than ever before, but your photos and your stories reveal that there are fissures here too, or fractures to, to borrow a phrase. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to get your thoughts on both. And Stephanie, we'll start with you and we'll give Will the, the final word on this and what he observed in the trenches. But in, in assembling the issue and in talking to all the various authors and editing the pieces and reading what they've written, what's your sense on that big picture question? And if it is unifying the, the nations of the West, will that unity hold as the conflicts roll on? That is the, you know, $24 million question yeah. or, or whatever. And, and I think what I took away from this issue is that, yes, there is un unity around beating, you know, defeating Putin. Um, but there are a lot of pressures uh, being put um, up against that total unification and it's fragile so um and that's that's one one aspect it's not um you know there's still a lot of other things at play um when you're looking at um geopolitical unity <laughs> yeah uh, thanks and uh, will what are you seeing when you're in the trenches uh, the world looks much different yeah i mean i i think that 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 stephanie's right and and i think we can sort of see it there in terms of the policy level um, and the initial reaction, there's definitely been an overwhelming unity across Europe. I think the question actually is, to me, which is slightly more interesting, is to, to what end? Um, mm -hmm. And to what end is this unity? So I think if we're, if we're looking at sort of the, the migration issue, which I focus on, and refugee issue, um, if the, the, the unity of the response, which we have seen in terms of the, the this, sort of groundbreaking response to, to Ukrainian refugees is still um, plagued by the same kind of structural racism, um, you know, the prejudices that have, that have guided, you know, these larger systems for decades. If those aren't addressed, then I'm not sure that we're really dealing with the, the, the root issue. And so some of these problems, while right now we're dealing with the conflict in Ukraine and the sort of the impact of the conflict in Ukraine, if we don't um, begin to use that unity to sort of really, you know, go deeper in terms of the analysis of how, you know, refugee policies are constructed across Europe and across the West, then I'm not sure to what, what sort of end result we're, we're ending up with. Yeah. Well, Will Sands, thank you very much for sharing uh, your brilliant work with both the Wilson Quarterly and with our viewers today. Thank you. Uh, in a minute, Stephanie, you know it's coming. I always ask her about what she's got planned for the next issue. But I want to ask you that question first. Where is your next project? Where will you be traveling to next? Um, I don't know. We're, we're sort of in flux. I'm, I'm um, trying to get back to, to Latin America, um, which is sort of going to be the, the focus for the next couple of years. Um, but also watching what's happening in Ukraine, so we will see. Well, the Fractures Collective is the website where yeah. people can follow your work. And thanks for joining us Thank today. You. Stephanie, uh, what do we got coming up in the next issue, and how can people access the Wilson Quarterly and even subscribe? 
uh, wilsonquarterly.com. Uh, subscribe. It's free. We don't inundate you with emails, but we um, do send you the occasional uh, update about our work. Our fall issue, I'm very excited to say, is well underway and it's tackling um, supply chains. We have seen both the war with the war in Ukraine and with COVID, supply chains are um, very important and we've got a number of angles that I think uh, it's really exciting to see this start to t take shape. Great. Well, thanks. Keep up the great work. Uh, thanks to both of you again. You. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.